if there ever was a genre which not only screamed home computer, but ended up being one of those which consumed lots of my gaming time, then the Combat Flight Simulator would certainly be it. Especially during those days, once I'd moved off 8 bits and onto PC gaming. But there's always been that spark of interest for how they fared on the 8 bits, because despite the limited power those machines offered, there was still something special about taking to disguise with those earlier efforts. Shocking frame rates and all. As always though, it's those corners of gaming's past with these early games where I can't help but scratch my curiosity in how these titles fit within the wider history of the genre. Which brings us nicely to Digital Integration's Fighter Pilot. Originally released in 1983 for the ZX Spectrum, conversions for other micros followed in no short order. The Commodore 64 would receive the first of these a year later, with ones for the Atari 8-bit computer family and Amstrad CPC appearing in 1985. Both the Atari and Commodore 64 versions were also released in the US, with Firebird publishing the former as MRCA Mark II Combat Flight Simulator, with Epix handling the latter, retitling it Jet Combat Simulator. Now this video will focus on the Commodore 64 version, which is the one I just happen to own a copy of, alongside the Spectrum Original and Atari versions, as I was able to play both of those on actual hardware as well. Fighter Pilot puts you in the cockpit of the iconic F-15 Eagle. Not the latest Strike Eagle, as Microprose would popularise, but rather the original air superiority fighter. Once you've loaded it up, you'll be situated in its options menu, allowing you to pick which mission you wish to fly and set a few items, your difficulty level, as well as some environmental options. The four scenarios on offer are landing practice, which sets you on final approach, allowing you to get familiar with the landing process, along with the handling of your F-15. Flying training is your pre-flight experience. You'll start on the ground, and once in the air, are free to roam around the map. It's one which is great for learning how the game's navigation systems work. Plus, getting a chance to practice a full landing sequence, and not just final approach. Air-to-air -air combat practice sets you right in the air behind an enemy fighter, with the goal being to shoot it down. Once you do, additional fighters will enter the map, giving you a shot to practice intercepting them and bringing them down. At which point, you'll finally be ready for the last scenario, air-to-air -air combat. You've got one objective here, to protect the four air bases from being destroyed. You'll face a single enemy fighter at a time, who'll enter the map and lock onto one of said bases. When you close to less than one mile away from them and are within 5,000 feet, they'll start to engage you. Break either of those conditions, and they'll return to focusing on their objective. Though the Eagle was known as an air superiority fighter, combat with fighter pilot is purely gun-based. To engage the enemy, you'll first need to switch to combat mode. This shows your gun sight and enables your cannon. It also switches your radar to tracking the current enemy. Now, this focus on short-range combat means encounters tend to drag out as you line up and chase down your enemies, using your radar and flight computer to close in on them both in heading and altitude. One big difference between the three systems that I'm covering here and how they handle this is really with the visual sighting of your enemy. Of the three machines, both the Commodore 64 and Spectrum require you to be within one mile before you'll get visual confirmation. Atari owners get a surprise benefit here as visual contact kicks in once you're within three miles. It's real handy as it helps compensate for one of the big shortcomings of that port, its overly sensitive joystick handle. So, let's talk about controls. While both the Atari and Commodore 64 versions require a joystick to play, you can fly the Spectrum version entirely from the keyboard should you not have a joystick interface attached to your machine. 
Something I found with all three versions was that for your key inputs to be read, you really need to hold the keys down for a moment. It's one of those things which can be initially unsettling, but you do get used to it. Even when it poses a distraction when in the heat of battle. Thankfully, the joystick controls on both the Commodore 64 and Spectrum respond quickly, which helps when making small adjustments when lining up on a target or during final approach. On the Atari version, this wasn't the case at all, as even the shortest tap on the joystick would result in much larger responses. The game tries to adjust for this by applying a limited degree of auto centering, but I still found myself overcompensating on the inputs way too often to make it something to just write off. When it comes to the keyboard controls that you'll need, compared with what you'll find with later simulations, the key controls here are organized rather well, especially based around the groups of functions that you'll deal with. For flying the plane, you've got controls for adjusting your thrust, applying flaps, operating your undercarriage, and applying brakes once you're on the ground. For navigation, you've got an in-game map which shows where you are in relation to your enemy target and the airbases. You can also set your navigation target between one of several beacons positioned on the map and toggle your flight computer between showing it and your instrument landing system. When in regular flight mode, the instrument landing system is used for lining up on final approach, whilst the flight computer provides distance to the runway when you're within range. When switching to combat mode, the flight computer provides the altitude for your current target which you could use to close in as you get within range. For combat controls, you've really only got the option to toggle in and out of combat mode, and of course, fire your plane's guns. These limited options uh, can be really beneficial for new pilots. It means you've got less to learn with understanding the simulation, and honestly, I think it gives them a better chance at success with it compared to some of the more complex games released down the line. One of the things that really impresses me with Fighter Pilot is its flight model. It's really quite impressive for the time, offering a solid sensation of flight, especially when at lower speeds. The impact of how your inputs affect your plane's handling is important to learn, especially with how easy it can be to stall if you're not careful. Now, combat on the other hand, that's a fair bit more limited. Not just because of the focus on short range gun only combat, but rather the AI. I found this never really challenged me until I turned the difficulty all the way up to its hardest level. And even then, it doesn't really offer much in terms of tactics to work against. I feel this is compounded by the short visual range of encounters particularly with the Commodore 64 and Spectrum versions. This can lead to having flybys, which can happen so quickly, leaving you open to enemy fire without having a fair chance of evading it. Now that's important because you can only take four hits before you buy the farm. So being prepared for how to evade enemy fire is critical. On the flip side, said enemies can thankfully only need a single shot before you down them. Though depending on the difficulty chosen, you're going to need to close in real tight in order to successfully land that hit. Which can be a bit frustrating because your sights don't really indicate when you are in range for a shot. I guess it's just another way it shows it's quite an early simulation after all. And this limitation also carries over into the scenery, or lack thereof. I really only noticed this because some interception runs can be quite lengthy, and with nothing to see on the ground, it meant said flights kind of felt rather tedious as a result. You're just sitting there watching the range meter go down and nothing else to break the visual monotony up. And yeah, you shouldn't be expecting scenery like that seen in, say, Flight Simulator 2, but having something to break it up would have been nice. There's also a consequence of this around mountainous regions of the map. You'll see these marked out on your navigation map, 
alongside a minimum altitude. And should you cross over into those regions below that altitude? Boom. You'll end up one with the ground, ending your flight without even a crater to mark the occasion. At least the Atari version gives you some flashing visuals as this happens, while both the Commodore 64 and Spectrum versions just go straight to a you crashed message. And that's just one of those little things which add a bit of personality to a game. Fighter Pilot is absolutely a flight simulator of its time. Though it can be easy for less experienced simulation fans to pick up and play, it really doesn't offer much in the sense of a long-term challenge, as the only measure of how well you did in a session is in the number of enemy fighters you shot down. Now, this is of course coming at it from the perspective of someone in Space Year 2022. Looking at it from the angle of 1983, and it paints a far more impressive picture, as the original Spectrum version of the game happens to be one of the first combat flight simulators released on the computer. So, compared to what else was out there, it really stood head and shoulders above them at the time. Now, part of this, I feel, is down to the background of its author, David Marshall, who worked on flight control systems for the UK Ministry of Defence prior to co-founding Digital Integration. And if that's not some serious cred, then I don't know what is. As for its release elsewhere, the Commodore 64 version had a similar advantage, as by the time it was released there, the closest thing in terms of air combat games were the ports of those early microprose flight games like Spitfire Ace, which really didn't offer much more than arcade action. Though by the time it hit the Atari 8-bit computer family in 1985, the standard, I feel, certainly shifted, as Microprose had delivered F-15 Strike Eagle by that point, which is a game I feel pushed the combat flight simulation landscape forward in quite a few ways, from its mix of air-to-ground and air-to-air missions, and its move to wireframe 3D visuals alongside the historical groundings of its many missions. So, despite Fighter Pilot being a fairly heavily dated game, you can see that it deserves an important place in the pantheon of combat flight simulators, even if in 2022 it's one that doesn't really offer much beyond historical value. Though, should you wish to give it a play, how do these three versions stack up? Firstly, on a visual front, there's not really much difference between them. I guess a result of the simplistic nature of its world and details. The instrumentation is presented the same on all three, though I'll admit I think I prefer the contrast and colour usage of the Commodore 64 version over the other two. The spectrum is a little more cramped because of the lower resolution, and depending on what kind of spectrum you're playing on, that might make it a little hard to read, whilst the Atari version doesn't pop out as much. As for sounds, it is a fairly early game, though I was incredibly surprised to find the Spectrum had no sound at all. I was expecting there to at least be some spot effects, like when firing your guns or when you crash or when you take out an enemy, but there's absolutely nothing here. Between the Atari and Commodore versions though, I think I really prefer the effects generated by the C64. The effects from the Atari's Pokey were far more intense and it felt kind of distracting at points. Now, I may want that intensity with more arcade-focused fare, but I feel it didn't work here. The SIDS synthesized sounds are far less harsh in comparison, and when you're going to be hearing that engine drone almost constantly, you can see why having a less harsh version is much preferred in my eye. We've already spoken over the controls, so let's just reflect that the joystick inputs are a little too sensitive on the Atari, compared to both the Commodore 64 and Spectrum versions. On the flip side, there was one little adjustment made for the Atari version I kind of preferred, holding down the fire button to engage your brakes when you're sitting on the ground. Based on the general keyboard handling, I'd probably avoid the Spectrum version unless you've got a dedicated joystick interface attached. Otherwise, you're just gonna get frustrated with the extra delays when you press keys to adjust your plane's pitch or 
Bank. And with that, I guess there's really not much more for me to do than to wrap this one up. Fighter Pilot is an interesting simulation, but one which is dated very heavily. Again, if you want to check it out, it's probably best to do so for the curiosity value, rather than get yourself seriously hooked into it. So really, there's not much more for me to say than to thank you all very much for watching.